Jesus' name. Okay. So, um, in the past week or so, uh, uh, Pastor Yorma, I don't know if you, you know the name, Pastor Yorma, he was in Finley. He went home to be with the Lord uh, in the past week. And uh, I have a quote here from him, and I loved it. It says, My life is not about me. Isn't that good? My life is not about me. Life is all about Jesus. Who He is, what He did, and what He says. I love that. And I love that that is in our hearts, and that is how we live. That My life is not about me. That's a hard thing for some of us to hear, isn't it? How many people like to hear that? Say, hey, life's not about you, Livy. Right? Take it easy. It's not about you. No. That she's the least. She was, um, but anyway, that's a great that's a great thing to think about. And where does that thought come from, or how does that thought hit us? And where do we find the reality of it? Right? Because we could say, yeah, I like that thought. That sounds good. But really, life is about me. That sounds nice. I like the quote. I'll write it in the back of my Bible. But in reality, life is about me, and I'm going to continue to live that way. Where do we reconcile those two? But at the cross. The cross. Where I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, but Christ lives in me. And then I see this, and I, when the, the, the new man hears the words of Christ, it's like, whoa, it's a different sound. In John chapter 8, Christ is talking to the Pharisees at one point, and He says, you don't understand the words I'm saying. And when you read the Greek, or when you study the Greek, I can't read the Greek, but I can look at it. Um, when you look at it, it means, it really means that Jesus sounds like Charlie Brown's parents to the Pharisees. Like he is speaking and they are hearing wah, 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 right? Like they don't understand the words he's saying because they're, they're spiritually discerned, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. So it could be that I, I could, before I am really born again or before I'm believing in Christ, I hear things about Jesus and I hear the words of Jesus and I say, that sounds cool, but I really, it, I don't get it. I don't know what it is. But then when I, am, I have the Holy Spirit and I am saved and I am made alive and the spiritual man hears the same sentence, he says, Oh, whoa, it's living water. It's like a breath, a lung full of air. It's amazing. I, mean, <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but it was terrifying at the moment. When Noah was a baby, he was like just a meatball. And he like couldn't, you know, he was just kind of lay on the floor. Just roll. He was born, and he was in like a one-year-old onesie in the hospital. Right? They tried to put him in the newborn thing, and he was just like, boom, like just boom, like popped out of it. So you know, and he he's on this little thing, you know, the little mat with the arch over it, and the mirror, and the bell, and you know, they lay and they play with it. And I just walked in the room, and it had turned over on him, and she lifted it up, and <gasps> he went like that terrifying, right? Terrifying. We were like, oh my gosh, right? Don't call DCS on me, please. But like, this is years ago in Maryland. So, no, it, it, it's like, oh my gosh. that It was terrifying for us. But also, like how good did it feel for him? <gasps> oh, that's a good breath of air right there, right? <laughs> Terrible illustration. Um, <laughs> but that's the way the spiritual man is when he hears the words of Christ. Like, we don't know what it is. But then when we hear them spiritually, oh, and it fills our lungs and it, it, it supplies our blood and it like courses through our body and we say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So, anyway. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We want to speak about the gifts of the Spirit tonight. We started a couple weeks ago. And we, we talked about how the context of the gifts of the Spirit. Remember? What are the context? The context of the gifts of the Spirit are the love of God. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, I'll show you a more excellent way 
more excellent way. Forget about the gifts. The gifts are important. The gifts are necessary. The gifts are given to the church for the advancement of the gospel. But if the gifts are operating outside of love, then they mean nothing. Right? Like it has to be. Uh, so we looked at uh, Ephesians 4, we looked at Romans 12, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Before and after, it's, it's talking about the love of Christ and it's talking about the new man. Right? So that's the context of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, but I want to encourage us tonight as a body, as the body of Christ, that we uh, would be looking at the church not as a place that serves us. Right? Isn't that shocking? Because it is. It is. It's a place where we come and we're fed. But I don't want to be someone who is here requiring service where I come into church and I just say, okay, what do you have for me? And I stick my hand out. And if I don't like it, I walk away. But actually, I want to approach the church, yes, as a place where I am built, yes, as a place where I am served, yes, as a place where I receive, but I want to be looking at at the church as a place where I can serve and a place where I can encourage and a place where I can build people. And... um, I, this church does this amazingly, and I want to encourage you in that, but also provoke you in a little more. Why not, right? Why not? Carlos and Melissa are like, what, else, what more can we do? My gosh. Um, but I uh, uh, lost the train there. Wait for it to come back to the station. Right? Um, uh, this is the church that we are building each other um, uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer says that the church is self-developing. The church is something that is self-developing and that it is producing the life that it is living. And it is turning over and it is uh, drawing people up. Right? If you could think of the church and the people in the church and the level where they are living, that each level wants to pull the next level up. Right? Like there's people who are curious about the church. We want them to now become uh, attending the church. And then we want people to be faithfully at church. And then people are engaged in church. And then people are serving in church. And then people are going and starting a church. About that, right? And could it be that we have every level in the church? Everybody is here. And if we are all thinking about looking and pulling people up, encouraging people, building people and um, uh, for the work of the ministry. Because we could say, uh, that's what you're for. Right? You could say that to me. You say, well, that's what you're here for. You're the minister. You're the pastor. Yeah, hallelujah. And I love it. It's, it's the third favorite thing, fourth favorite thing about myself. Right? There's my salvation, my wife, my kids, and then my, my place is the pastor. Right? I love it. I love it. And yes, I believe God has gifted me for it. And if he hasn't, then I would just be standing here drooling. <laughs> but, the, but the gifts that he has given to me are for the equipping of the church. And so that the church can minister. And so that the church can edify itself. Read with me in Ephesians 4. We can start in verse 4. Is that what I said, Mel? Verse 4. Yeah, okay. We could go back to 1, but we'll start. Okay, we'll start in 3. <laughs> it says this, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring, working, working to preserve unity. What unity? The unity of the Spirit. Uh, we, we don't work to produce unity. We work to maintain unity. The unity that's in the church is given by Christ uh, by in, the, in our salvation. Uh, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But, right, okay, there's a lot of one in there, right? There's no individual there. There's a lot of one. But each one of us 
each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But also he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And look at this. And he himself gave, he himself gave. He gave himself, but then also in the resurrection and at Pentecost, he gave and he gave gifts. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Here it is. For the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints. Is that good? We're, you're equipped. You are being equipped. Um, and what, what equipment do we have? Well, we have faith. We have faith. Faith is like, oh man, even the armor that we are given in Ephesians chapter 6 is acquired by faith. Do you believe it? Is there literally a helmet and a breastplate at your door? Maybe Bill Knowles has that because he does medieval reenactment. But do you have a shield and a breastplate and a you know gospel shoes and shin guards and a belt and a sword? Maybe some people have swords. But... Um, it's not there, and we say, oh, there it is, and you put it on before you go out the door. No, by faith. Where is my faith built? Romans ten seventeen, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God preached. Where is the Word of God preached? Here, in the body of Christ, by a pastor teacher. And in that, he is equipping you and building, building you in encouraging you in the application of the Word of God by faith. That's it. The pastor teacher is not there to tell you what to do. Unless it's read the Bible. But the pastor teacher is there, and we, we've said this on Monday nights, and I love the quote, the pastor teacher is there and as, a, as an under-shepherd of Christ, our shepherd, and we lead people to pasture, so that they can feed themselves. Right? Like we, we as, as a flock, right, the, the Marlboro Church, we are together listening to the Bible, we are together hearing it preached, but then as individuals we go and we look to the Bible for our food. And we look to the Bible for our relationship to Christ. And I look to the Bible for, and I establish my own relationship with the Bible. That's the job of the pastor teacher. And um, uh, Paul says in Romans 12.4, he says that everybody has some, some way of functioning in the body of Christ. And I think that's a great word. That we are come here and we function in something. And I want to be functioning in the gifts that God has given me. Not, not overly analytical and concerned or worried or insecure about it, but freely ministering and freely serving the way Christ has called me. So let's look at the couple words real quick, okay? Uh, he gave some to be apostles. Uh, we, we, I believe in ministry, we believe that this gift is not, not active today, the apostolic gift. Um, we could say in one sense it is. Right? We could say that there are uh, men of God in our ministry who have been sent out and they teach and they plant churches and they have great uh, anointing in their life. And we think of Pastor Shabelli and Pastor Schaller and these guys. Um, but in the biblical sense, they're not apostles. The definition of an apostle you can see in Acts 1, uh, verses 21 through 26. And there's three things that we could say. Um, are required for a biblical apostle. One is that he followed Jesus from the baptism of John onto the resurrection. That limits it to a certain three and a half year period. Okay. Uh, also, um, the second point is that they saw Jesus after the resurrection. Forty days 
After the resurrection, he was walking and coming and going throughout the earth, and people saw him. <clears throat> Finally, and Paul actually uh, says in Acts chapter 9, when he saw him um, on the road to Damascus, right? Emmaus was the other guys. Damascus, that, that was he saw the resurrected Christ, and that's why he said he was one born out of time. Um, but then the other third point is that they were appointed by Christ. And you can see them there in that passage. So, uh, And then also uh, the apostles wrote the New Testament. And I think uh, Billy Graham said it this way, that the Bible has a back cover. I don't know if you noticed. That means it's it's complete. <laughs> right? The Bible has a back cover. It's complete. That there is no new revelation. Nobody is writing the Bible anymore. And if you come across somebody who is, Walk the other way, right? And grab a coffee and relax. Like, yeah, like that's not happening. So the the these thing in this sense, the apostolic gift is not functioning. And then the second one he mentions here is a prophet. And we could look at this the same way, where there were prophets in the New Testament, and also the prophesying, like John, in a sense, is a prophet, right? because he wrote the book of Revelation, uh, things that will still haven't been accomplished, but will. But again, that's over now. The The back cover is there. So uh, a prophet had two two functions where he would tell of things that are coming. Tell of things that are coming. What's that foretell? Tell of things that haven't happened yet. But then also forth telling, uh, telling things that are in the Bible. And we could say, in a sense, that this is happening today, that there are people with great insight in the Word of God. I think of Francis Schaeffer, if you know him. He's a uh, eccentric guy. He wrote a lot of books, and they are very interesting. One in particular is called The God Who Is There. And if you read about read what he is saying and how he sees culture going and the conclusions he came to, he was very accurate. Um, but I wouldn't say he's a prophet. I think this gift is is uh, not happening. But also, God is free to do whatever He wants to do. Right? And if He gives someone prophecy, then He gives someone prophecy. But as a, as an office, uh, I don't believe that this is uh, happening today. Okay, okay, that's good. Does that make sense? Uh, clear. Okay. And there's you know there's a lot of different beliefs in that. I'm telling you what I believe personally. Um, but then we see this this gift here, pastor and teacher, and we've always understood them as one one office. There are pastors. There are a lot of men who are gifted to be pastors. Not every pastor is a teacher. Not every pastor has the gift to teach, and not every teacher has the gift to pastor. But it needs to be that the church has somebody who is gifted as a pastor and a teacher. Um. Personally, I love teaching the Bible. It's uh, and I, I I love it. It's it's my favorite thing. I love preaching the Bible, but more I love teaching the Bible. And uh, it's so necessary that we are taught biblically and we have a, a doctrinal understanding of the thought of God, because we don't want to just take things willy nilly and go for go for a ride with them, because we can get ourselves in some interesting situations biblically. So. Uh, and then pastoring is a gift of, like we said, being an under-shepherd. That Christ is our shepherd, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. But then he is pointed under shepherds. And uh, the, we, we have been called to care for the flock. He says in Acts 20.28, 20, he says, take care for the flock. And we could say, okay, and then, but it goes further. Who he purchased with his own blood. So a pastor has the understanding of who the people in the church belong to. They belong to Christ. I, ooh, no, this is not my church. This is, this is Christ's church. He is the head. And I have humbly been called to be the pastor. And uh, I, in, with great reverence to God and great respect and love for you, 
I I I will lead, I I lead, and I hopefully we lead to green pastures where you can find some good food. Okay, but what is the point of these gifts? Paul says it right there in verse twelve for the equipping of the saints, for the equipping of the saints, preparing the saints. Preparing the saints to be effective ministers, to be effective witnesses, to to have a uh, a meditation, to have conviction, equipped to raise a family, equipped in business, equipped in faith, equipped in evangelism, equipped in Sunday school, equipped in AV, which we're man, we're loving it. Right. Uh, equipped in running the cafe, equipped in evangelism. Ooh, did we miss evangelists? I skipped right over evangelists. <gasps> A necessary gift, evangelists. Right, evangelists. Have you felt that you were a gifted evangelist? I have in my in times felt like I I was so gifted to evangelize, and then other times I felt like I don't even know how to start a sentence. Right? This is the way it is. God gives gifts. And when He turns it on, you're ready and you feel the presence of God and you feel the witness of God and you, uh, you, you have a way of articulating something or relating to people because it's a gift. And then other times you butcher your way through it by faith and trust that God will do something with it. Right? Uh, but all of this is happening for the equipping of the church for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. the work. So, so who is it that does the work of the ministry? The body of Christ. The body of Christ does the work of the ministry. And uh, yes, the pastor does a lot of work, and it should be that way. And it should be that pastors work hard. It should be that pastors pour their heart out. And I... I you know, I, I could, I could, God could move me to work harder, I pray. Lord, give me more energy. Give me more conviction. Give me more direction in things. Uh, I, I think a leader should be the hardest working person in the room. I always respected that kind of leader in sports and in, at work. I could follow someone who was ahead of me, working harder than me, playing harder than me, right? It, it provokes you and it draws you up, doesn't it? Like, oh, there's something to attain for. Uh, the pastor is out there, uh, you know, just like sunburned and parched and uh, just but continuing. And uh, we have a great example of that in Pastor Stevens, that he, he burned so bright and then all of a sudden his body broke down because of the years of ministry. We have a great picture in Pastor Morrison. Pastor Morrison, we went to Peabody a few years ago. And as we were driving down, he was seeing the exits on 128 and the names of the cities. And, he, and it seemed like every exit we passed, he said, oh, I did a Bible study there. 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 And he said, how many nights a week were you doing Bible studies? He goes, at least six. It's like, Phew. oh, my gosh, what a workman. What a workman. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for examples like that. But what does that do for us as the church? Does that mean that we can say, well, at least somebody's doing it, and we sit back with our popcorn and we enjoy the show? No, we engage also. And we say, where can I, where can I, put, my, where can I put my work in? Where can I give? How can I serve? And I, I come and I, I am built. I am edified, right? Doesn't that, edification means building, to be building. And we build each other. They're building each other. And I come and I'm built and I'm built. To what point? To the point that I'm bored? Or to the point that I look for something different? To the point that I'm not entertained anymore? No, to the point that I begin to build other people. And I begin to pour out. And I find that it's necessary in my Christian life that I am pouring out. And that I am emptying myself to other people. It would be like a sponge, right? At some point, you can't fit any more water in the sponge. It's just sitting there. But then when it's squeezed out and you throw it back in the bucket, and 
soaks it back up. That's us. That we come in and it could be that I'm here on a Wednesday night and I'm getting built up, but then on Sunday morning I'm expressing and I'm pouring out. Or I'm, I'm being soaked up. I'm soaking it up on Sunday morning with the message and the fellowship and then on Sunday night I'm pouring out like the youth ministry does. But um, we, we've had a few months. Anybody pick up on something the last few months? It's been quiet and it's been different. And the church has been, uh, and now I'm not going to say in the sidelines, but I'm going to say we've been put in a little bit of a, a time to meditate. And we put in a time where we can't be as active, but we can be, but our mind is still active and our heart is still hungry. And now we're getting back together and we were looking forward to opening things back up as far as Sunday school and maybe the cafe and the bookstore and we can do things. But let's not just slip back into the mode that those people do those things. But instead, let's be engaged in what is God calling me to do. And there are many, there's a lot of needs in the church. And I don't know, maybe I don't express that. But, I'll, but there are needs in the church. Our Sunday school program is awesome. And there's been faithful people in it for 30 something years. But it could be that there's a new vision for the Sunday school. And someone else can take it and, and I'm not going to say revitalize it even though I just did, right? Uh, I'm not, because that means that somebody's not doing something and Beth Fuse has done an amazing job and every teacher has done an amazing job. But maybe there's a new vision and that there could be, um, like a, <laughs> a revitalization. Okay, we'll just say it that way, right? And, um, Teachers, faithful teachers like Kelly White and Cindy Wright and Pastor Mark and Stephanie and Carlos and uh, Pastor Donald and uh, Tonita and uh, years of teaching and loving and serving. But could you could you now take that up? And could you say, I have lots of energy and I have love for people. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what's going on. But I have a love for people and God is stirring me to love people. And there are little kids in this church who are so... Eric and Becca. How could I forget Eric and Becca in Sunday school? just want to hide from them right now. Just Oh, my goodness. Um, and they, they soak up the love that we give them. They do. They're little sponges also. And they, they hear enough from mom and dad. <laughs> oh, I just... Oh, something just hit me. Oh. Oh, no, I had a conversation with Noah last night, and it was, oh, it was amazing. Oh, oh, gospel. It was beautiful. Right? But they need it from us also. They need to hear it from, and I love Eric and Becca, and Eric has said, I, I am the uncle of the church, and I think he, he's got, like, I want to be the cool uncle in the church, and the kids, they see me, and they like, that's beautiful. That's a gift. It is. And it's necessary. And it could be that maybe um, younger people could be engaged with the kids. And that's what I'm saying, like pulling the next generation up. The teen ministry, you know, they, they, you guys could be helping with the kids and like lifting them up. And they look up to you. And they see you walking around and they say, man, that guy's cool. Right? And imagine if you sat with him. Like, remember when you were 12 years old and somebody who's 16 years old actually recognized your existence? You were like, whoa. Imagine if you would uh, more than just say hi, but you could love them and teach them the Bible. It's a beautiful pri- 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 privilege. Privilege, right? Also, we have the AV team and Melissa and uh, Malcolm and Craig and Sal, and there's a lot of energy that goes into it. But also, there, there's a lot of help. That we you could have if you have any kind of techno, technological savvy, you are welcome. Right? It's, it's welcome. Right? Craig has the soundboard, but he is welcome to teaching someone and having that be. And it could be a service that you provide to the body of Christ. And actually, I think of Toby Garrity because he he uh, installed the whole sound system, and this was his heart in it. Right? That I'm pay, I have a a role to play in the in the operation of the service, and if it's heard well, that's a ministry. And I like that, that, that approach to things. 
that nothing is insignificant in the body of Christ. Nothing is too small. Standing at the front door, handing out bulletins and saying hello. New people, have you noticed we have new people in the church? Crystal's here. Hey, Crystal. All right. Do they feel welcome when they walk in the door? Don't assume they do. Because if everyone assumes they feel welcome, then they don't feel welcome. Because no one says hi. <laughs> and I see it. I see it in the body of Christ that people make it a point to go to new people. And it blesses me every time I see it. But could he, could he, do you have an idea of how that could be more effective? Do you have a vision for it in your own life? Reaching people, encouraging people, welcoming people, drawing them in. And, uh, you know, for me, for me, I, I love this church and, and I love what we do and I love how we do it. We're so free. We're led by the Holy Spirit and there is like a great liberty in it. But I would love to add a little more structure to it so that we all know what we're doing and that we're all on the same team and we're moving in a direction and we see the encouragement that's happening and we are looking at each other and we're saying, hey, I know what you're up to. You're building people. That's beautiful. This is what the church is called to. And this is what I mean by it's self-developing, where it is, it is producing the life of Christ in the body of Christ. And the only result in that, and like I said about the levels, the, the result is that we will be propelled out into the world and we will go and we, will be, uh, uh, we won't be contained here at 187 Pleasant Street. We'll say we're going to have to go uh, start a church in Clinton. We're going to have to go start a church in Shirley or something. I don't know. I don't know. Right? Who knows? God knows down the road. I'm not saying next week, but I'm saying is it, it's in my heart that we could be going this way and we could be moved by faith and we could be equipping uh, each other and provoking each other and serving each other uh, as we come in here. <laughs> Actually, Pastor Schaller said it one day. Uh, he said you could either have a, a catitude towards the church, or you could have a dogitude towards the church. And if you like, don't don't bear with me if you have cats. I'm not. This is not an attack on cats, right? But you know, cats, right? Like they're kind of you know they float through the house and they do their own thing. And as long as you do the things that they require, they don't have any problem with you, right? You fill that bowl with food, you clean that out of there, and we'll all be good. And if not, we could have some problems. I could float through the church that way. And I could look through the church and I could say, oh, what's that all about? Or I could come into the church like a dog. Oh, man, what can I do? I just, Oh, man, I just want to please somebody. Oh, my gosh. And I'm not saying in this sense of it, but you know what I mean? Like so much wanting, like, let's play. Let's do something. What can I do? All right. And I like I like that. And if you're more of a cat person, that's okay. But um, <laughs> we function. We are all functioning in some way here in the church. Romans twelve four. We have a function. Um, find a function. Pray. Ask people. Ask uh, me. Ask other pastors. Uh, if you are serving under somebody, ask that pastor, do you see anything that I could be doing, a gift that I have, or some way I could be doing something? It's okay. It's good. And I'm not saying we're going to delegate, you do this, you do that. Uh, but also, if you feel like you are called to, to something, take ownership of it, do it, and it, you know it will. you will be delegated to do it. Right? Like I'm more than you, like, do it. Let's do it. Hey. If you're there, let's go. And um, you'll find joy in it. You will find joy in it. And uh, the the church will find joy in it. The church, the, the body of Christ, confirms the gifts of the body. Like I could say, for me to be a pastor was not in my own my own thinking. But God put it in my heart. And then somebody said something to me and I laughed at them. And then I was a pastor in Silver Spring for eight years as an assistant. And I said, I could do this for a long time. I love being an assistant. It's perfect. Right? 
The pressure's on someone else to stand up there every week. Actually, Pastor Kim was away for three weeks one time. The first Sunday was awesome, right? Boom. Second Sunday was okay. Third Sunday, where are you, Pastor Kim? I'm not the one gifted to be preaching every single Sunday. But like we see, Pastor Doug gets up here and preaches. Pastor Donald gets up here and preaches. Pastor Van Doren, Pastor Mike. We have different guys do introductions, and it's so refreshing to hear that. But then there is the pastor who is the consistent voice of the church and the direction of the church. And I can say that I didn't see that in my life. But then somehow somebody else saw that in me. And then somebody up here listened to that about me. And then God confirmed it. And I could say, I could look and say, ooh, I don't know. But then I remember that 12 men agreed on one thing. And I said, oh, well, there's a miracle for you. Right? There's a miracle. Oh. And there's a confirmation in the body of Christ about the gifts that we have. And um, don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Quote of the night. Don't, yeah. <laughs> Homiletics, huh? Chewing gum, don't yeah. <laughs> but look what happens. Verse 13. The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God in a perfect man to measure to the measure of the stature of the fulfillment of fullness of Christ. Unto the perfect man. Right? Joyce and Brian have been married a couple weeks now, and now she knows that there is no perfect man. Right? <laughs> what is what is <laughs> what is he talking about? What is the what is the the perfect man? And what is the the equipping of the church and the edifying of the body of Christ is building up to a perfect man. What is that perfect man? But it is the p- completion of of the body of Christ. It is the day when the last person receives Christ and the church the church is complete, the body is whole and the rapture comes on. But until that point, until Christ appears in the sky and we hear that crazy sound that we've never heard before, until that day, we will be equipping each other. We will be ministering to each other. We will be provoking each other in love. We will be working so hard to to hold up a banner of of the love of Christ. So we anticipate it, but also we anticipate it not in the sense that we are sitting on a park bench and just waiting, looking at the sky waiting. But instead we are running around like Pastor Donald's message about the wedding invitation. What a message. Did you hear it? Oh, man, you got to listen. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. Right? We, are, we are running through the streets with an invitation, with the gospel. But that, that motion, that running out, it starts here with this encouragement and with this equipping and with this provoking and with this being filled up and then being pushed out. And, and when it happens, it's beautiful. So um, please, please consider with me what role you could play in the church. Uh, consider if you could teach in the Sunday school and pray for the Sunday school as we plan to open again in, after Labor Day. And, then, and pray for the Sunday school. Pray for the teachers. Pray for new teachers. Pray if you could be a new teacher. Uh, pray for our church. And uh, let's look at this church Not so much as a place we visit, but as a mission that we are a part of. Well, because we are all missionaries here. We are. Every one of us. We're called to the mission field. And it's right out there. Right outside the door. It's in your car. It's in your home. It's at the gas station. It's at the grocery store. It's at uh, the coffee shop. It's at the hairdresser if you go to those things. But consider it prayerfully, humbly, and say, God, I've never thought I could do it, but do you think I could do it? And he would say, giddy up. So, amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for this amazing reality that you equip us for your ministry. 
Thank you. You've counted us faithful and you've put us in the ministry. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.